ask everyone to take a moment to introduce themselves and they get started. So please go right ahead. Okay. Uh, everyone, thank you. Uh, I'm Ilya. I, uh, I work on a project called Web Recorder uh, as part of a nonprofit called Rhizome, which is a, based in New York and online, and their focus is digital preservation, primarily born digital art. But uh, you know, the, this tool that, that we're building is, uh, actually f fits in really well uh, in terms of uh, essentially building a new way for people to create web archives. And uh, I'm just going to start with, with the demo. Uh, and so Web Recorder, which is available at webrecorder.io, uh, as you can see here, you start with a, sort of a blank page where you can enter a URL. And uh, any URL you enter will immediately begin to be archived. And so I'll start with, uh, start with, with, uh, with Twitter, for example. And so in the top left corner, you could see s sort of how much you have recorded. And this recording uh, status indicates that, that what you're browsing is being recorded. And so we, have, we also have this uh, neat auto scroll functionality where it'll automatically scroll the page for you. And as you can see, as it's scrolling, uh, I've already recorded 17 megabytes. Uh, so this is just the, the Twitter front page, uh, which is uh, perhaps not as interesting. What I could also do, uh, I've actually already recorded 58 megabytes because uh, the connection here is quite fast. Is I can actually log into my account and uh, And then I can actually sort of record my own Twitter feed, uh, sort of my own unique version of Twitter.com. Uh, so no one else has this particular, uh, you know, as, as we talk about uh, the web and how, and how it's changing and, and sort of what it means to, to, to archive the web, I'm currently recording Twitter.com as it's personalized for my particular account. And so I can also auto scroll here. There'll probably be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of my tweets will be from 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 this event. Um, I could also click finish here, uh, and uh, I have this temporary collection as I haven't logged in. Um, I can also log in uh, and then add this to, to my to my personalized account. Um, I could also start a new recording. For example, if I go to the home page and I wanted to. And so I've started a new recording session here, uh, especially for, for, for our current hashtag. And I can actually uh, sort of record this live. Uh, and I could also do the, the auto scroll functionality. And then we'll, we'll sort of see that I could just sit here and, and kind of wait for it to, to record everything that's, that's happening. Um, and yeah, so, so that's sort of the, the basic idea behind Web Recorder is that uh, sort of a lot of the discussion today has been sort of assuming that uh, that there's a, a third party that decides what to archive, and with this tool, our goal is sort of to bring web archiving to everyone, so that anyone that doesn't have to be a professional archivist not not that this tool is you know we want to support them as well, but that anyone can create their own web web archive, uh, and I, I just want to show a couple more examples. Uh, and for, for example, uh, some of the things that, that I think are, are pretty relevant. Uh, so here's another example with Twitter uh, of a, uh, a Twitter feed uh, of, uh, regarding uh, a leak from WikiLeaks and sort of the article that, that was written about it and how it sort of compromised privacy of a lot of people uh, by Zainab Bexi, who, who's an a academic and, and journalist. And so, what this archive shows is actually a whole Twitter conversation. Uh, so I, I just loaded one page, and we see here is a conversation between Zainab and, and, and WikiLeaks, and there's sort of uh, a pretty interesting conversation, actually, that also mentions archives. Uh, and this entire Twitter conversation would, you know, we could also archive it uh, a piece at a time, but WebRecord includes a functionality called a static snapshot where you could take uh, well, whatever is in your browser and take a static, a static snapshot of it so that you have that HTML 
exactly as it is in place. Uh, and so that, that can give you, uh, for example, an, an archive like, like this one. Um, so that's, that's with, uh, with Twitter. Uh, another example from my, so actually using this collection. Um, I was creating, uh, this was a, uh, this was a protest in San Francisco uh, after, a, after a police shooting actually. And, the, and there was a hunger strike and I was trying to archive this event and this is actually kind of interesting because the, the protest went right by Twitter headquarters. And so there's a video of this protest right outside Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. And it's a video in a tweet, so I know I thought, I thought oh, sorry, maybe I'll, I'll turn this, the sound down. Uh, but so these are some of the kinds of things that, that we can create with, with Web Recorder. Uh, a few other examples. Uh, this was a recording of. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, this will. Uh, this is a recording of Periscope when, when the uh, Democratic Congress people uh, staged a, pr a protest in the House of Representatives, and the official, uh, the official cameras were turned off, and people were uh, live streaming through Periscope, uh, and so we were able to to archive this pretty well. And so you could kind of see this, this archive. Uh, and, and this was, again, this was sort of me kind of going and, and archiving this on my own. Uh, and, and, and again, this, this is uh, sort of entirely user-driven archiving that is possible with, with this tool. And uh, you can also, there's talk about other things besides uh, Twitter. And so here's an example of, of Facebook, uh, which is a little bit more difficult to archive with sort of traditional API-based tools, uh, but this is sort of a, a Facebook page from Rhizome uh, from about a year ago. And you could see we're logged in here as, as Rhizome. As, and again, we could also scroll here and, and sort of interact with the page. And, and so entirely, uh, the idea behind this, again, is that sort of the user chooses what to archive. There's not a, a, an automated system, uh, per se. Uh, there's not a third party. but that the archive is sort of, anyone can start using this. And we, we've just launched our first version uh, uh, a, f a few weeks ago. We were in beta for a while. Um, and yeah, and so we're also really excited about collaborating with the DocNow project. Uh, and we kind of actually applied for, for our grants around the same time. Uh, this project is also supported by a, by a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, Web Recorder allows the user to archive something once they know the URL. So once you have a URL here, you could enter it and start recording. With Documenting and Now, uh, we'll, we'll help users find what URLs that they want to archive. And we're sort of talking about collaborating in a way that would allow users to then, once they figure out what they want to archive, to connect to Web Recorder and enter these URLs in here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so that, that's sort of the, the the basic idea, uh, and then if I, I can also log into my account, uh, and I can actually I can import the temporary connect collection that I just made, and added. And uh, once I log in, sort of this is sort of my uh, my personal archive is under web recorder slash Ilya. Um, and sort of th this approach to, to web archiving uh, sort of addresses some of the ethics issues that I think were, were raised, but also brings, it, brings about new ones. Uh, in, in, in that, for example, this, this is an archive that I created, and, and so I can choose which, which collections here to make public or private. Um, however, that also means that if someone is referring to this, to this archive, they're not guaranteed that this URL will always be, for example, if I have uh, this demo doc now collection, uh, I could, I could uh, right now it's not public, I could make it public, but I could also choose to make it private at a later time. And so I think that that sort of brings some nuance to the discussion of what to archive, what not to archive, because uh, in a way, users could choose to archive things but not make them public, or they could choose to make them public at a later date, or sort of to revoke the, the privilege of, of having them be public, uh, and, 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 and kind of, yeah, and, and, and basically, uh, Lots of lots of different uh, nuances that that could arise there. Uh, users could also download everything that, that they've archived in a 
in a standard work file, which is sort of the, the standard format that's used by web archives. Um, and yeah, so that basically that that kind of I, I think uh, also brings about uh, other ideas that that this could lead to is, for example, users could uh, make things uh, make create archives that are private, but then choose to share them with specific other individuals, and, and that's something that that we'd like to add in the future, uh, rather than just making them completely public for everyone. Uh, and so that there's sort of a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities with with this that that can be explored in the future. Uh, and I think I'll just show a couple more uh, of the from the demo here, so we could also. Uh, so I think this is a, a live stream that we were, and again, this is, a lot of this is sort of me kind of going online when things were happening and trying to archive. So this was from the, oh, maybe this was, no, let's see if this works. Yes, yeah, so this is a live stream that I think was from a, uh, a Black Lives Matter protest where there was a shooting, and I think this was, uh, some some of the live stream that I was able to capture at the time, and so this is this is just archived by simply by visiting the page and browsing the the live stream. And so again, we're trying to our goal with this is to make this work for as many different formats and sort of for video and, and kind of very difficult content that that constantly changes. So we're, we're sort of dealing with with different platforms and and, and their changes, and uh, it's sort of a constant challenge. But the idea is to sort of provide what we call high fidelity archiving. So whatever you see in your browser is what's being archived and, and that we try to get it to as, as close to that as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, and so you know, we'll, we'll be continuing to work on this project and looking forward to collaborating with DocNow further into, uh, into uh, possibly figuring out ways that, that we could better integrate so that once users figure out what they want to archive by t Twitter that they could then go into into web recorder either automatically or, or uh, yeah, preferably as, as seamlessly as possible so that they could then create the, the, their own archives. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I encourage you to, to check out web recorder. Uh, there's an introductory video that, that you could try. Uh, and uh, if you sign up, uh, you get five gigabytes uh, to, uh, to play around with and create your own archives. So you could do this today. You could start using web recorder and creating your own web archives as you browse. Thank you. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. I'm Sylvie Rollison Cass. Um, I'm a web archivist at the Internet Archive. Um, working specifically on Archive It, the web archiving subscription service. Um, I also work on some of our collaborative and uh, event-based collecting pro uh, projects. Um, we've collaborated with individuals and institutions to archive content around movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, other events, most recently the um, Pulse nightclub attack. Um, and I also work on our education and training programs and assist in the design and implementation of new features and functionality for Archive It. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is um, kind of what we have been doing, what we've done in the past, what we're currently doing, and uh, what we might do in the future um, with Archive It around uh, archiving the web and social media content. Um, but first, I just wanna mention the Internet Archive and the Global Wayback Machine. Um, anyone who's used uh, the Internet Archive probably had a chance to use the Wayback Machine. Um, it, has content dating back to 1996. It's a pretty comprehensive snapshot of the web. Um, but what I wanna mention is the Save Page Now feature. Um, it is what allows anyone with access to the internet um, the option of including a URL in the global wayback. So um, all they have to do is go to the Save Page Now page, add the URL in, and click Save. It becomes part of the wayback machine. Um, it's, it's saving URLs at a rate of about 50 per second, so it's pretty uh, frequently used. Um, it does only get the first page, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but I wanna talk about Archive It, which is the subscription web archiving service. Um, 
from the Internet Archive. It was first launched in 2006. We're celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. Um, the Archive It web application allows users to add and crawl URLs um, and create curated collections of archived websites. Users can crawl on demand um, or set up scheduled and recurring crawls at different frequencies depending on a use case. Um, this is what we did use to build the, uh, the event-based collections. Um, and then the, our users have the option of making their collections publicly available on Archive.it. Um, and this is an example of a, a collection from the International Internet Preservation Consortium, the IIPC. Um, they have a collection, uh, they collect Olympic con Olympics content um, every, I guess, two years, winter and summer. Um, and so this is from 2012. You can see they have their URLs. This is uh, just their Twitter content. So they have their URLs here. They've added a lot of metadata um, so that it's easy to browse and use from this page. Um, I have a few statistics here. So uh, our partners have been using um, or crawling social media for kind of a while now. Um, and it kind of make, it makes up a significant portion of uh, their collections. Um, as of last week, there were nearly 30,000 Facebook seed URLs, so the URL that the users add and crawl. Um, nearly 35,000 Twitter seeds, and then almost just over 40,000 YouTube seeds. This is an example of a Twitter capture, one of the earlier ones um, that one of our users added. This is from 2008. Uh, I think it's really interesting to see, obviously, Twitter from 2008. Um, and I think it's also funny that Bird Flu has its own Twitter account. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys that. Um, so since the beginning, Archivet has been using Heratrix, which is uh, the traditional web crawler. Um, it was really, you know, it was good at capturing content in 2006. It was maybe a little, you know, it was pretty good at capturing content in 2010. And then coming up to 2014, uh, the web kind of started to evolve, and so we uh, have kind of evolved to uh, adapt to capture it better as well. Um, and that is where Umbra comes in. Umbra is a crawler technology that works alongside Heratrix, uh, which you've been using since 2014. Um, Umbra runs on the first page of each seed URL and is able to trigger client-side scripts that require users to click or hover to activate. Um, it also triggers things like dynamic scrolling, so it gets um, more of a Twitter feed or more Facebook. Um, and then it feeds these URLs that it finds into Heratrix. Um, so our engineering team is currently working on a new browser-based crawler. It's called Brosler. Browser plus crawler equals Brosler. Um, and that sort of combines what Heratrix and Umbra are doing into one system. Um, it's a, a modular web crawler. Um, it uses a real browser to capture HTTP, HTTP traffic as it's loading. Uh, it uses the browser to fetch pages, capture embed, embedded URLs, and extract links. Um, this is a little GIF of what it looks like as it's going through a Twitter feed. Um, it can also work with other tools to improve capture, for example, uh, YouTube DL. So even though YouTube videos are something that Archivit can currently capture pretty well, um, this is going to help improve capture of other video or streaming media sources in the future. Um, we have a few ongoing collaborative development projects in the works that I want to mention. Uh, first, we're looking into options for ingesting external work files, um, so web archive files, um, and other web data into archive it collections so that users aren't limited to capture methods that, that are provided by archive it. They can use other capture methods, incorporate them into their collections. Um, we're also looking into collaborating with Social Feed Manager and other API-based capture methods to complement more traditional capture methods. Uh, we're collaborating with the IIPC on a few projects, including a crawler and harvesting hackathon that's happening in September in uh, London, I believe. That's right. Um, we're looking into API integration for data sharing and system operability to make it easier for our partners to access and share their data. Um, uh, with other systems. Um, and then finally, we've been working with researchers at Old Dominion University on uh, linking archived content, um, including social media, with storytelling tools like Storify. 
Um, regarding improvements to access, we're looking into ways to incorporate API-based captures into collections um, so that they're accessible alongside crawler-based captures. Um, they don't just look like kind of a, uh, they're, they're more human readable, is what we're hoping. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, Archive at Research Services, which allows users to access different types of data sets from their collections. This is a link um, that I can share uh, to a workshop with an introduction to data mining and computational tools and methods for working with web archives. Um, it also provides access to data sets um, and some exercises that you can run on it if you're interested. Um, to sort of summarize, I'm finishing up. Uh, um, collaboration on new methods of capture and access is really key to providing more complete captures and also to providing context to archive social media. So we're um, kind of focusing on that right now. Um, and then we just need to be continuing to revisit uh, the indexing, processing, and replay for social media as it evolves. Um, we definitely see a lot of room for discussion and development around the cooperation of different capture me mechanisms, especially API-based capture. Um, as well as how new processes and tools are gonna align with the current work format. Um, and I think this is probably preaching to the choir here, but um, if the web archiving community can document the needs and goals of end users, we can develop tools that are really better suited to their needs. Um, I think Documenting the Now is doing a good job of this. Um, but so the needs might be ethical, practical, technical, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the the UI talk tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Matt Phillips. I'm kind of falling asleep. <laughs> I'm gonna try to wake up here. Uh, I, I work in a group called Library Innovation Lab at Harvard. We try to create cool things in libraries, sort of be an outpost, um, sort of future thinking. Uh, in libraries, one of the things we do is develop web archiving tools. And so um, the web archiving tool we work on is this thing called perma.cc, it was motivated uh, by a finding. Um, we published this paper where we investigated uh, all Supreme Court opinions and found that 50% of links included in the Supreme Court opinions are, they're gone, they're no longer available. Just kind of a big problem if you're trying to you know, follow an argument. So you know, what can we do to create stable, stable web archives so those links aren't, aren't rotten? Uh, we created this tool called perma.cc, and it's, it's, it's a really simple tool. I'll kind of give you a live demo here. And this is kind of a not very well thought out kind of freewheeling presentation. So if you have, if you have questions or whatever, please let me know. So the, so the idea here is that I want to cite something on the web. I'm writing a paper or maybe just a blog post, um, and, and I want to cite something, so this is a little bit meta. So I wrote this blog post a couple of weeks ago about a totally separate project. You know, maybe I'm writing something in some journal about it and I want to cite it. So I take it, I dump in my original URL here. I'm already logged into perma, which is at perma.cc. And I click create permalink in real time. It'll go out and grab all of those web assets, create a work file for me, and, and give me a new link for it. And so here it is. So now, uh, perma.cc has created a web archive. It's given me this link that I can include in my paper. This web archive is stored at uh, a number of locations, uh, including uh, trusted partners like libraries. Um, so hopefully it's pretty stable. Uh, it's, right, so you, so you can include you know, this link instead of the original one, which you know, looks like this. Or you can include both, say something like, uh, I'm citing this, a backup is available at um, you know, this location here. And so this is in use by a bunch of folks in the, the legal domain. 
we really had a breakthrough earlier this year um, when we were used in a Supreme Court opinion, um, kind, of, uh, kind of a really huge deal for us. So the Supreme Court opinion published earlier this year, and they cited PERMA somewhere. Ah. Well, I'm not finding it. Anyway, somewhere in this line of, or this page of text. So PERMA is kind of out there in the legal world. That's kind of what PERMA is. You enter a URL, creates an archive for you, you get a, a different URL back, and you can include that in your, in your paper, your blog post. Um, so that's kind of the thing I've spent the past couple of years building and kind of my connection to the DocNow um, community. So hopefully we can kind of collaborate to, to, to build similar things. Um, one thing that I think PERMA does really well, and I hope I can kind of help Doc now do is sort of you know measure kind of what we're what we're building and our engagement in the community. Um, that, that idea that you you kind of are what you measure. Um, so for us, we we have this engagement page where we kind of try to measure a number of archives created, and so this starts from when we started in June 2013 uh, up to today. And we track number of users, and we track number of organizations, these are usually journals. We track the number of libraries that manage everything in PERMA. And we do this kind of cool thing uh, where we measure daily activity. Each vertical line here is an archive that's created starting at midnight um, or 12.01 for New Day, running through midnight tonight. Uh, you can see a little bug. It's the, we have this little now thing, which is an hour behind because um, I'm used to being on the East Coast, and I'm not, not on East Coast time now. It's a highlight of the bug. Um, so, so we can kind of see, you know, in, engagement. Are people actually using this thing? If not, should we, you know, kill it? Should we shape it in a different way? Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think this engagement thing has been one of, sort of measuring engagement has been one of the really, really important things in PERMA, and I, I hope I can kind of help um, build something like this uh, in, the, in the DocNow effort. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is something, some recent development. This is something that just started um, last week. We have this idea of, um, you know, what if you create a web archive and you want to see how the thing that's up now has changed? Uh, it's kind of a common use case. Did someone um, change a page? Is it different now? Um, so, so we put together this. This is still rough. It's not. It's not in production yet. Um, it's, it's sort of on our staging, or it's on our dev machine. Um, so this is the archive that you saw me create earlier. Um, you know, this is just a normal archive. It's got the PERMA header at the top. You can click Show More Details. Maybe there's a little button that lets me show the difference between um, the archive and what's on the live web now. And maybe you get sort of this kind of three-column pane thing. It, to me, this feels like not quite the UX, right UX yet, but we're still working on it. On the left, you get the thing that was archived um, like a day ago. And then in the middle here, I actually went into our WordPress instance and updated the blog post. I added a sentence, but it's a little bit difficult to tell. You can see it gets a little bit longer here in the center. Uh, and then all the way on the right is the difference between the things. So where does the archive kind of start to change? So you know, this is kind of interesting if you kind of visually want to very quickly kind of see if something has changed, is the, is the, the earth shifting under you? Um, if so, do you care? Do you want to investigate? Um, so that's kind of the, the thing we're working on, you know, like as of last week. That's kind of all I have, perma.cc. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicholas Taylor. I'm the Web Archiving Service Manager at Stanford University Libraries. Uh, in that role, I essentially manage Stanford's web archiving program, so uh, managing technical development, helping set policy, service design, and other considerations. Um, I wanted to start by saying thank you for the, to the DocNow team for um, inviting me to participate in this effort. Um, I'm engaged frequently with a lot of uh, Web Archiving Communities, Society of American Archivists, the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, the Archive at Partners, and the International Internet Preservation Consortium. And I would definitely agree with Burgess's comment this morning that um, this is a very 
much more diverse group of participants in those conversations. Um, the next thing I would say is, um, uh, with keen consideration for the possibility that I might be the last presentation of the day, uh, I'm going to be talking about systems interoperability and technical collaboration for building web, web and social media archiving tools. Um, so I work, <laughs> I work currently at Stanford. I previously worked at the Library of Congress. And uh, having done web archiving, um, from the, the privilege of two comparatively well-resourced libraries, I would say, and, and seeing that those libraries struggle with it, I think one of the things I think a lot about is how do we lower the barrier to entry for web archiving? And I think by extension, as we're talking more and more about social media archiving, how do we lower the barrier to entry for uh, that activity as well? So Sylvie talked a little bit about the, the Heratrix archival crawler. So for a long time, most of the web archiving that took place took place using this, this one tool. Uh, so this was a tool that was created by Internet Archive and the Nordic National Libraries in the early aughts. Um, there's a popular joke among web archivists about Heratrix that uh, it's really great for archiving the web of 10 years ago. Um, so Heratrix is a tool that uh, deals comparatively well with the static web that used to be. So it would uh, access static documents, follow links, and just capture the things that it could see. Uh, but the problem is that the, the web of today is much more complicated, it's much more interactive, a lot of content hides behind the execution of JavaScript, and so um, we've needed to develop new tools to be able to continue to archive it effectively. So thankfully, um, thanks to some of the work of the individuals and organizations represented by the folks on this panel, by the folks in this room, uh, and others in the web archiving community, we've uh, developed new approaches for being able to maintain archiving efficacy. Um, so Sylvie talked about some of those approaches, headless browsers like Umbra that are able to execute JavaScript so that you can find the content that's hiding behind it, uh, archiving proxies, which allows for a wider diversity of archiving clients uh, to be able to capture materials, and then leveraging the APIs of popular social media platforms. So we're not just simply scraping what is presented to a crawler, but we can use the APIs to uh, capture the data more reliably and with higher fidelity than we might uh, otherwise be able to. I think, uh, so this is a slide from um, Justin Littman's presentation earlier this year uh, that's documenting some of the architecture of their social feed manager application that they've been working on. And I think it, it demonstrates um, a uh, good possibility for alignment between uh, web and social media archiving. So in this case, um, they're using uh, Twark and the Wark prox, which is like a proxy layer, to essentially uh, mirror the requests that Twark is making to the Twitter API uh, and storing that data into Wark files, which are the, the standard file format, uh, container format that is typically used for web archives. Um, so the idea in Wark is to capture not just the networked objects, the web pages, images, JavaScript, and CSS, but also to capture the networked communications that uh, produce those artifacts. Um, so I think this is, this is a good approach for um, facilitating integration of web and social media archiving systems. I think another way that we could um, work on uh, bringing the technical approaches for web and social media archiving together is by focusing on APIs. Uh, this is a grant project that Stanford uh, got from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in collaboration with Internet Archive, University of North Texas, and Rutgers University. And the focus of this work is uh, to build a data transfer API to more seamlessly be able to move WARC data between systems. So that could facilitate um, integration of different types of, of crawler tools with different types of repositories social media archiving tools with different types of systems to be able to move WARC data between systems. So if you were capturing data using Archive-It, but you wanted to move it to a local repository, this would be a mechanism for being able to do that uh, more easily. So I think one of the things that this question prompts, and I think we're thinking about a lot, is um, what are the kinds of technical architectures that facilitate uh, contributions by a broader community? So. Um, if we design our systems more modularly, if we take advantage of APIs, does that mean that more people can participate in building smaller pieces of functionality that plug into a larger, a larger whole 
and allow the community to, to do more with less. Conversely, I think um, we'd like to think about what are the community frameworks that enable uh, participation by a broader uh, group of individuals. So um, not just those who are already doing digital library software development, but how can we get the archival community as well and participating in providing use cases and requirements and feedback that inform the direction in which these technologies evolve. Uh, another question I have, and I think it's a central question, is how do we build more and more distributed capacity? So how do we um, upgrade the uh, cultural heritage community's ability to do web and social media archiving, and how do we also broaden the set of institutions, associations, organizations, and individuals uh, to be able to do this activity as well? And I think that rolls up into sort of larger question of um, how to make web and social media archiving more inclusive. Uh, because there's a very broad set of stakeholders for whom lowering the barrier to entry for web and social media archiving, I think, matters. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that I think that um, my observation has been that the, the DocNow community has done a very good job in sort of engaging with these questions so far. And I hope that that community will be more durable than uh, the length of the project or um, the development of this specific tool. And so I was going to end there, um, but talking to Burgess this morning, um, I added a few slides specifically on the National Digital Stewardship Alliance Web Archiving Survey, which I think has some interesting data about organizations doing web archiving that might be helpful for this conversation. Um, so this is just a bit of background. The National Digital Stewardship Alliance is a free member association in the United States um, that consists of, of largely cultural heritage institutions, libraries, archives, universities, museums, uh, government agencies. Um, we do a survey every two years since 2011, so there have been three so far, where we ask the web archiving community about uh, how are their programs going, what kind of tools and services are they using, what kind of access are they providing to their resources, and what kind of policies guide the collection um, of content. So uh, the first thing I wanted to highlight was that a growing percentage of the respondents to the survey, uh, web archiving institutions, are universities. And so in the last survey, that's gone up to about 65%. There are a large number of uh, organizations that are represented by like 1% or 2%. And those include uh, local government, K-12 schools, public libraries. Um, those would be the main ones. So, there's a lots of types of institutions that are not already engaged in web archiving, and there's good reason to think like they would then also have trouble in transitioning to participating in social media archiving as well. Um, in terms of the focus of web archiving efforts, so we asked whether they were archiving their own content or content that they were under some sort of legal mandate to archive versus archiving of third party content. And the shift there seems to be uh, towards more focus on their own content. So in terms of the growth of web archiving institutions, it's largely university archives that are focusing on archiving their own university web presence. Um, and so what that will mean is that we'll have a web archival record that is very over-representative of the .edu space and underrepresentative of uh, much other content. Uh, this is a slide about staffing. So in the last two surveys, we've asked about um, what is the uh, level of staffing for web archiving activity in terms of uh, full-time equivalent employees. And uh, what's worth noting here is that <clears throat> notwithstanding the growing importance of collecting and curating web content, uh, <clears throat> programmatic investments in web archiving have remained um, relatively low, at least on the basis of staffing levels. Uh, external services are incredibly important in the web archiving space, um, and there's been a trend towards um, most of the respondents to the survey, most of American web archiving programs that are doing web archiving are using centralized services and largely, largely archive it. Um, what's a little dismaying is that if you look at the local, there's really been a, a drop in the number of institutions that are trying to um, tackle the full web archiving lifecycle fully in-house. Um, what is perhaps optimistic is that there seems to be a larger number of institutions that are relying on a hybrid approach of using external services and local services as well. And the hope is that focusing on APIs and sort of more modular technologies will help to uh, further that trend. And I think this is the last slide. <clears throat> so in the, <clears throat> in the last survey, we asked about whether institutions had social media archiving policies. 
and by and large, they don't. Um, so I think, I think anything that we can do um, in this community and in conjunction with other, uh, other interested communities is to help to develop uh, community best practices and community frameworks for um, how we approach social media archiving. And that's all I got, thank you. So um, we have a, a time for me as chair to throw one question back to the panel and open the rest up to the, all of you. Uh, and the, the question I have in mind for you is uh, how has what you've heard today changed what you think about the work you're already engaged in as purveyors of tools and services and being actively engaged in this broader idea of web archiving? Um, the, the framing that I feel has shifted in my own head as one of the developers on Doc Now uh, is is not uh, to think of this sort of broad ethical question of should we be getting it all or should we should we in no way try to get it all um, because that's completely unethical. Uh, but rather, remembering the stories we heard from Dr. Neal and Dr. Jackson earlier this morning about uh, connecting with the one person in the KFC or how the people with very small presences on social media end up being the source of these incredibly important stories that break the news cycle in their own way. Um, if we're not at least starting by looking at all of it, we're going to miss a lot, and we're never going to get that. We've heard that a couple times today. And the same thing is true from, if I understand Dr. Pupil Wells' paper on making big data small, we're never going to find those things unless we're starting with maybe a big vacuum. But the pressure then is on us and Doc now to figure out a way to introduce that standard of care at an acceptable level uh, of design and implementation that so people can discover those voices and make informed ethical choices about what to use and what maybe not to keep deliberately. Um, that's a great challenge, uh, but uh, maybe uh, maybe we can dig into that a little bit later, either in this conversation or when we're all fresh in the morning tomorrow, we'll talk about the design of the app itself a little bit more, or maybe when we're really not so fresh later tonight in the uh, <laughs> restaurant. Um, but with that, I'd like to throw it to each of you if you have uh, comments on that question of what, what you've heard today might have shifted in your own minds. Um, sure. I, so the Internet Archive does fall on the side of get everything, in case you weren't aware. Um, but, uh, and Archive it itself doesn't take a, a stand on, on curation, but we do want to work with people to make sure that um, we can build collections of, of web content, um, especially with institutions that may not, you know, have a, a web archiving program, but have uh, really important um, content and, and people who know where to find it. Um, but I think what, what has been kind of eye-opening today, um, something that I want to take back, is that I want to make it a little more clear in the beginning that uh, most of this content will be public. That's what the Internet Archive does. But you know, we can, we can um, have an embargo period or you know, just sort of set out some, some initial planning beforehand to, to make the collections more um, conscious of the, the people that might be included in them. That's not necessarily the technology, but that's something that I think um, really kind of stuck with me today. Sure. Uh, well, for, for me, I, th I think that uh, it sort of reinforced that, that I think what, what we're doing with with web recorder is really important in that I think people aren't uh, aren't aware uh, of that there is sort of a possibility for people to create their own ar archives and not depend on a third party or another institution to do the archiving for them. And I think, as the example the the uh, the activist mentioned on the panel, that they were concerned that uh, things won't be re represented accurately if someone else is doing the collection or, or is, is selecting what is being archived. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, if if, the, if they are empowered to create their own archives and choose what to make public and when, uh, if that would sort of change their, sort of the, how, how they would view social media or, or, or how uh, archiving is, is viewed in general. And, and I think that up to this point, there, has, there haven't been many tools that, that enable that. And so our goal with, with Web Recorder is, is really to, to kind of empower people to create their own archives uh, and, and sort of choose what exactly what they select and, uh, and, and, and whom to share that with and 
if they choose to delete that later uh, and not sort of store it permanently in a, in a large institution, that's totally fine as well, and, and, that, and we want to empower them to do that. Um, uh, and you know, we're also d developing Web Recorder as uh, it's, it's also fully open source, so people can can uh, can run it on their own infrastructure and sort of have their own uh, in-house version of Web Recorder. Uh, and so I think that that's also sort of maybe important for uh, um, kind of privacy considerations. If, if if you want that data stored somewhere on your own uh, infrastructure, that that would be possible as well. And and, and I think that uh, thus far, yeah. So the I I think that the I think it's important to kind of uh, sort of publicize what we're doing even more because I think people aren't aware of them creating their own archives, and and th that sort of kind of st struck me as as, uh, as 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 kind of a key point. Yeah, one thing that was really re reinforced for me is that Twitter, especially with that second panel, Twitter was used so frequently and so much because it's it's really easy and it's really fast. It feels like you know there's very little impedance to get a message out to your network. So if, it feels like if we can kind of do the same thing with with archives, or like kind of work towards that goal, like create archives really quickly, really easily. Like I don't know who who knows kind of what what will be created. Um, sort of sort of a multiplier, I think. Right. Uh, yeah. Just to add to that, I, I think p part of what uh, makes Twitter successful is that there are millions of people tweeting, and they could. And, and and that's happening in real time. Uh, if we could conceive of the same approach to archiving, that there could be, rather than you know an, an automated crawler that decides which which things to archive using some sort of algorithm or or seed list, there are millions of people people that select I want to save this and I want to have this data for myself later. Uh, that that could I think really change the the archiving field and and. You know, there's no reason that, that that couldn't be possible. Of course, there's there's lots of questions to answer, but w I, I think that we could imagine that that sort of approach. So I, I think the effect of much I, of what I've heard today has been to <clears throat> maybe rethink and reevaluate um, the assumptions I've had about web archiving practice. Right. So like I know a lot of the conversation we've had is around. Um, ethics and best practices for social media archiving, but I think I'm starting to rethink whether some of the assumptions that we've always ever had for web archiving are appropriate. Um, and I think also about the, the conversations we've had about transforming the archival profession, that part of the discussion to have there is, um, is highlighting the importance of ethics for the sustainability of web and social media archiving. Um, I think that there's a lot of the discussion focuses on the ways in which ethics are a constraint on web and social media archiving, and I think that there could be a lot more focus about how web and social media, uh, how ethics enable web and social media arch archiving to the extent that um, if that practice is not viewed as legitimate, that social norms will, um, will not allow for that activity to continue. And so I think that like, if we think that web and social media archiving is important, it has to be grounded in ethics because it's otherwise not going to be, it's not going to be sustainable, it's not going to be legitimate. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I come from, I work in a library and I've worked in a library for a number of years and I feel like one of the reasons people like libraries and they're kind of a big deal in society is because they're trusted spaces, they're trusted entities. And so that very much fits with, with what you're saying, like you have to have that trust. And if people sort of think that archivists are um, not being thoughtful about what's being retained, then you kind of lose that relationship. I have sort of just a more practical question. I was wondering if um, the three of you who talked about uh, from a CC uh, archive it and um, web recorder could talk about the, like the differences, it's like what is the same and what is different about your tools and when would one want to use one or who might want to use one and not the other? I, I don't know, I think it's a question mark. I almost feel like I can envision a world where they all kind of like merge together to one cool tool. But I, I, we've really I focused, no. no, no, don't do that. <laughs> Did you give a talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> so I, just to jump in, I'm going to do this policy separate from I'm sorry, but so we need this ecology of separate tools, uh, a 
aligning the long APIs uh, like you guys are doing in the Wasabi process is the right way to go. But we need Perma CC. We need the web reporter for the uh, personalized tools. Obviously, we need this subscription-based service on archive. We need the Internet Archive to be grabbing anything. Any of these things could disappear at any moment. And if we align on the one true solution, uh, I think our risk is tremendous on, on just having all of this blink out. Sort of like Topsy, who was archiving all of this crap anyway. They didn't use the word archiving. They were building services on top of it. But then when the business case ran out, it just goes away. And if we were relying on that, we would have absolutely nothing. Well, I think maybe making them more interoperable is, is important, though. Um, especially, well, so Archive-It is a subscription service. It's used by institutions. It's not so much used by an individual. Um, it's, you know, not cheap, necessarily. So um, that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a bigger uh, project than I think maybe using Web Recorder might be. Uh, maybe not. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, if someone were to use Web Recorder and they had a collection of works and then they wanted to donate those to a library, that could be incorporated into, if they had an archival collection, into their collection. I think that would be really important and good moving forward. Yeah, uh, I agree with, with, with most of, the, of what has been said. Yeah, I definitely think, think that, uh, Having distinct tools is important. That you know, there's no one true archive that will save everything. I think that that's definitely the wrong approach. Uh, in fact, the, the more archives, the better. Uh, and and sort of having ways to to collaborate and, and share uh, share data f from multiple archives uh, is, is certainly uh, a way to move forward. And so sort of the, the the Memento API is, is sort of one one step in that direction. And, and other other ways of of, of collaboration are, are, are being discussed as well. Um, and yes, as, uh, as Sylvie mentioned, so sort of web recorders is kind of at the, you know, we're approaching web archiving from a very different perspective in that it's sort of very user driven. So whatever, uh, whatever a particular user sees in their browser uh, is ideally what, what will be archived. Uh, and it's, uh, we're offering it for free at this point. Uh, and our goal was to always offer a free version of it. Uh, and it's also f fully open source, so anyone can, can run their own version. And hopefully, uh, at some point, maybe there will be tens or hundreds of, of web recorders out there that people are running on their own and creating the, their own archives. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, yeah, having diversity in, in this field is, is really important. And, and at the same time, also being able to connect to existing archives uh, and, and sort of and, and, and build uh, APIs, uh, for example, or ways that uh, that you could check one archive. Uh, if if something isn't in this in your own personal archive, you will check a larger archive that might have some of that data. And, and so you could sort, sort of layer archives uh, in a way that you start with sort of a very your personal collection, and then you look at a global collection. For example, if, if you're looking at some social media data, you might want to keep that private in your own archive, but then you link to a public article in the New York Times that may have been archived by, by the Internet Archive, and uh, th that way you could just link to, to it for, for that. And, and so, uh, yeah, ha having a layered approach to, to archiving, I think, will be, will, will be really important. Ready to go with 
one thing I feel that the web archiving, web archiving community has really done well is sort of um, kind of gathered around this really common interchange format called WARC, W-A-R-C. Um, so if you create an archive in PERMA, you can, you know, send it to Web Recorder, send it to Archive It, and everyone kind of knows how to uh, sort of read that file format. So kind of a, kind of a massive win, I think. Underlying structure is, is a, a common language. And so uh, following the sentiment, I agree that uh, we should have these different tools. It, it makes sense uh, to have a, an ecosphere of diversity uh, with our technology tools. This is maybe a philosophical question for the development team for DocNow as well as the, the, the techies in the room. Should DocNow be building or integrating? What's the, or, or a little bit of both, or a lot of both? Is it more important for us to build a brand new tool or is it more important for us to integrate existing <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, I think, I kind of feel like we're limiting ourselves to our work environments, which always puts things in perspective for me, because we are, we can push our boundaries of the walls in which we work, but only to a certain extent. And I think when we were thinking about Doc Now, it was so much larger than the walls that we work in. And when I listen to what everybody's saying, I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm thinking, how do we educate the layperson? Because at the end of the day, it's a personal archiving challenge, right? And some people will just buy, you know, buy something off the shelf because it's easy. And then I think about, I have a six-year-old, and he's the generation of builders. So by the time he turns about 13, he won't want to buy it off the shelf because he'll be like, Mom, I know how to code, I know how to do all that. And do I have a tool for him? Because I, can I keep up? And so the tools that we are building now are useful for right now. And in five years, we're going to have to tweak it. And in 10 years, they're going to be able to do it themselves. And so to me, what Doc now represents is how do we discuss the ethics issues? How do we educate currently? How do we educate the people outside of our work walls so that our collections are strong across the board? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we also have to discussions about, you know, sort of the social implications of that, right? We're going beyond uh, the technical. And I think we've started a really great conversation. Um, it's not like, you know, we started social media archiving or web archiving, right? We're just adding sort of another layer to it, right? To ask people to look a little deeper. And I'm, and I'm really excited to hear our panelists here talk about sort of what they've gotten um, from today, because in a lot of ways, sort of you've been, you and your institutions have so, you know, we're not doing it everything and we can't do everything. I think it's important to think about integrating and working with um, some other projects, uh, whether that's sort of technologically or whether that's just talking to other projects and creating a space where we can all be in the same room to sort of address all these issues. I think that's really important. But I think we're doing exactly what we, what we set out to do, you know, which is to, to have a conversation, uh, build something that, that is really easy To, to do some simple analysis, um, you know, and you know, I think we're right where we want to be. So, um, yeah. And I, I feel like there's, I, I feel like there's some subtlety to that. Like in Perma, we were able to build Perma because we rely heavily on a tool that Ilya uses or Ilya built and a tool that Internet Archive built. So we're kind of a different service, but kind of two of our core pieces of technology are not built by us. They're built by someone else in the community. So it sort of feels like maybe the same sort of pattern for DocNow. <laughs>